Uh, it senses the truth. It senses a lie. It knows how to feel. It knows how to heal. And it knows how to die. Justice, justice and Testing one, two, three. Yes, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. 
Welcome, everybody, and uh, we're about to get started, so if you could find a seat. Thank you. at the table for everyone born clean water and bread a shelter a space a safe place for growing for everyone born a star overhead and God will delight we are creators of justice and joy compassion and peace yes god will delight when we are creators of justice justice and joy for those we neglect a place at the table a voice to be heard a part of the song the hands of a child in hands that are wrinkled for those we neglect the right to belong and god will delight when we are creators of justice and joy compassion and peace yes god will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. For all who have breath, a place at the table, a covenant shared, a welcoming space, a rainbow of race and gender and color. For all who have breath, the chalice of grace and God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy compassion and peace yes God will delight when we are creators of justice justice and joy for you and for me a place at the table the wounded and sore with need to forgive in anger in hurt a mindset of mercy for you and for me a new way to live and God of justice and joy compassion and peace yes God will delight when we are creators of justice justice and joy for everyone born a place at the table to live without fear and simply to be to work to speak out to witness and worship for everyone born the right to be free and god will delight when we are creators of justice and joy compassion and peace 
Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. That was a good one, Jerry. Thanks. <laughs> Amen. And good morning and welcome to one and all, to those of you here and those of you on Zoom. Um, please know that wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. This is our byline. It's wonderful. I'm Sandra Weil. Uh, I'm your announcer and your liturgist in a little while. Uh, I invite you to find a seat, which you've already done, and get comfortable, which you look like you are. Um, if there were children here, and in the future, if there are, please know that we have activities over in the fireside room for the kids, an activity basket. Um, if today happened to be, I'll call on you one, in one second, Raj. He's holding up, I believe you're holding up the basket into which new folks can put a card that they would have filled out, correct? Is that what? Oh, and money, yes. We happily take... <laughs> We happily take donations. Uh, yes, thank you for that reminder. But we do have a guest card uh, for new folks to fill out and to put, it, it can be left back uh, where Raj is. Um, the invitation is always to stay after for coffee and goodies and there's some really great stuff over there. I've already had my apple pie this morning um, so that we can get to know you better and you can get to know each other better. Um, and then highlighting some of the items in this week's Friday newsletter. I have actually six quick things to bring to your attention. In that newsletter, there's info about the next event at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. It's called, the whole program is called Come to the Table. It's a time for people to get together and talk about important things, but you do need to sign up. But details in the newsletter. Um, there's info in there also about opportunities to help beautify this space, and that includes flowers and, again, read, read more in the Friday newsletter. Uh, details about what's happening on uh, upcoming Sundays, who will be visiting with us and what the topics will be. Other details about uh, an art exhibit, exhibit that's happening that might be of interest um, to folks workshops and hiking activities led by members and friends of CCC. That usually means Frank Valone, but others. Um, info about social justice uh, uh, activities that you can be involved in, things to pay attention to, and actions that you can take. And just a quick reminder that today is the food truck event um, at noon at Larkspur Landing, actually now called Marin Mart. Meet at the food trucks at noon and find some good food and there'll be wonderful people there to, uh, to connect with, like you all. Um, so in this, at this moment, as you're able, please stand up and greet your neighbor in whatever way feels appropriate.
right. Peace be with you. And also with you. All right. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much again for being here, and welcome to Reverend Rivka Gavert, who we'll hear from in just a moment. Uh, this is the part of the service, though, where we invite you to share your prayers of thanksgiving and concerns you might have. If you're joining us on Zoom today, feel free to put those in the chat, and Lisa, our co-host, will share those out loud. So for whom and what would we pray today? Jolyn will start us off. Now you don't have to adjust the uh, microphone height. It's just... So these are prayers that uh, were requested online. And the first is from Adelena, and she asked me to read it, and, it, and she says, prayers of deep gratitude for all the love and prayers and check-ins during the last year for my mom and myself. You are all precious to me. Your support is everything. Oh, beloved. Caroline. For Caroline and Sophie, oh, beloved. For Casey prayers. and Rina, oh, beloved. Yes, Lily. Oh, okay. For Eva, who tore her Achilles tendon. Yeah, oh, beloved. Hear our prayer. Yes, dear. Yeah, and her son, Jacob. <laughs> this is your time. You share. Oh, hooray. Zoe graduated from Lewis and Clark. All right, congratulations for all those things, oh, beloved. We know Lewis and Clark. Yeah. Others, for whom and what would we pray? Good, good news. Okay, Dave, Viri, and James. Yeah, oh, beloved. Hear our prayers. Oh, okay. For the passing of Rosalie and, and the hole that that leaves in your family. Oh, beloved. Hear our prayers. Yeah. Uh, regarding Evelina, mm -hmm. um, yesterday was my birthday, and Evelina agreed to come with me out of Port Bay Station for an adventure. And it was really good to go with us. And her mom did die last Wednesday. Mm -hmm. you know, and she was just really Mm -hmm. I'm grateful too. Um, yeah, I was waiting for that. Uh, Lily and Lily. This was your 21st birthday, is that right? Oh, Went out to point race. Okay. <laughs> Lisa, anything like okay. Others, uh, Scott, go ahead. Yes, Feliz Single de Mayo. Um continuing prayers uh, for the people of God uh, and for all of the students exercising their constitutional rights mm -hmm. and that it be peaceful and meaningful mm -hmm. and um, accomplish what it's supposed to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Prayers for students who are um, demonstrating courageously, um, getting text updates from my two beloveds uh, from the campus up in Eugene and several around here that you know of, I'm sure. If anybody is interested in how we can support those students, um, talk to me afterwards and we'll figure something out. But yes, prayers for the students who are making history right now uh, and who are often accused of not caring about a lot of things in their generation and are clearly showing their passion and alternate ways of being. So courage for them, protection for them, protection for their faculty and other adults who are um, trying to, to really support them. Oh, beloved. 
and of course for peace in Gaza and uh, in Israel and in the, the Sudan and in Ukraine and here in the United States, right? We is, Are we are feeling a shortage of peace? Yeah. So prayers for peace, oh beloved. Lisa? Um, amen. All right. So for Adolfo's safe return this week, oh beloved. Just in time for pride. Shannon. Yes. Hope we see you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. So if you want to say hi to Hope, go ahead and look up there and wave. Hope, we're waving hello to you and to all our other friends on Zoom. We're so glad for you today. For all our beloveds uh, here and on Zoom, oh, beloved, hear our prayer. Yes, Barbara. What? Oh, I did know that. Yes, Pat's birthday. We need to have a, a more organization with this. <laughs> Happy birthday, Pat. Did you also turn 21? Okay. This is not, you know, this is not like Chevy's. You're not going to get a sombrero and a hat, at least not from me, right? Okay. But happy birthday to you. So glad you're here. Other concerns or things that you want to share and celebrate with this community? I'll ask uh, for prayers for traveling safety. Uh, Deshna will come back this week. And uh, we have other friends who are traveling from this community. So for all those who are on the road or tra traveling, uh, oh, beloved. Mm -hmm. Prayers for me. Prayers for Mary Vesey and Joan Ripple, oh beloved. And um, our friend Peller Marion, who's going to be having uh, hip surgery soon on the 15th of May. Thank you, oh beloved. Prayers for Peller, oh beloved. So for all those spoken and unspoken, I'll invite you to join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. You can follow along with the words on the screen or in whatever version that you have learned. This is from uh, Enfleshed, a website uh, that's that's got uh, free liturgy by uh, community and clergy of color. Let's together pray these words. Mother of us all who dwells within and beyond. in body, soul, and heart. Forgive us for the harm we cause as we seek to forgive those who have harmed us. Lead us away from everything that destroys and liberate us from the hands of evil. For you are Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, spirit of the living God, fall across the
So the first chunks of readings go as follows. The first one from Acts. God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. And another from Acts. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out even on the Gentiles. And then from John, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Who gets to determine who accepts and, and is given the gift of the Holy Spirit? Who's unclean? And how do we make those determinations about someone else who is a dwelling place for the divine. When I was a girl, having first come out to my parents as a lesbian, I was outside of spiritual tradition. I was outside of family because our families are so knit up with the traditions that we participate in. When my mom finally got there and realized that I'm still her kid, her response was, oh, honey, I'd love you even if you were an ax murderer. Intent is not always the same thing as impact. I know that her intent was to let me know that no matter what in the world, she loved me. And I could take that in. But I could not take in being compared to someone who has ripped the life out of someone else. Our intent does not always match up with our impact. And how we determine that somebody is worthy to receive the divine spirit is often tied up in our ideas of who they are. We've been talking the last couple of days, first went off our, our webinar um, on Thursday and then this morning, about things that separate us from one another. We've been talking from the head on Thursday around things like microaggressions and unconscious bias and the ways that you know, we make decisions about the wisdom that is actually inherent in all of our lived experience in all of our bodies. And earlier this morning, we, we went more deeply into the idea of our embodied experience of our lives and how the messages that we receive from little kids on up inform how we move in this world, how we hold ourselves in compassion and how we hold others in compassion. So it's going to be a little bit unusual, I'm sure, for some of you, but we're actually not going to have a long, lengthy sermon. We're going to have some moving of these bodies with a series of questions that I want you to think about, about how they impacted you in your own life. So you'll see around the room, we have words, religious affiliation, age, disability, race, orientation, gender identity, and my, my bifocals are right in the middle of that line, so I can't see what's over there. Hmm? <laughs> Class is back there. Sex is back there. All of these different things make up who we are. 
we have so many identities living within us in this container that is the home for the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And I'm going to ask you to move around a bit today. So, so take your time. But take a moment to just glance around a little bit so you see what some of the signs are. Because I'm going to ask a series of questions. And I want you to position yourself near the sign that, that is your answer to each of these questions. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So the first question I'll ask, and we'll use this as, as a way of getting started. So enter your body, enter your knowledge of all the pieces that go into making you, you. And how would you answer this question? The part of my identity that I'm most aware of on a daily basis is, which one of these words speaks into what you're aware of on a daily basis. And for those of you who are on Zoom, um, if you want to participate by typing into the chat, um, what part of your identity is something you're conscious of on a daily basis? Okay. As we settle into places, I'm noticing that, that there's a clump of us, and I would be over in that spot too, where we're definitely aware of our age on a daily basis. You know, what are the aches and pains that we're dealing with? How are we seen or not seen? Yeah. And we've got another clump over by, let's see, we've got orientation, and we've got race and, and ethnicity over here. Got a, a clump of folks who are conscious of their, their gender identity and expression. A few people at disability. That's the other place I reside a lot. Right now, I have my, I've managed to be up here without my cane, but if I was walking down down the aisle, I wouldn't be doing it without my game. So these are the things that we think about all the time. And so they're, they're fresh in our mind. And maybe when we think about these things for ourselves, we might think about them in somebody else's body and experience. Next question. We're going to do the same thing, but we're going to move around. The part of my identity that I'm least aware of on a daily basis is. So what don't you think about? And then kind of go, oh, yeah, that is something that is part of me, but I don't live into it very often. Yeah, I don't live into that experience. It's like I don't think about it. It just is there. It's just there. Yeah. So just take a moment and notice where people are. Notice what you have in common with people and what you don't have in common with people. Some of us get to be grateful and don't even have to think about the fact that we are able to move around in this world. A lot of people don't have to think about race and its implications. But some of us do. Some of us do have to think about how our bodies and our age and our 
gender and our expression and our family's racial history. We have to think about these because they all impact us at one point or another. We're going to do just a couple more. The part of my identity that was the most emphasized or important in my family growing up was. What's the message you got the most? What did you have to get drilled into you that was an expectation? The part of my identity that was most emphasized or important in my family growing up. Yeah. For some of us, for some of us, the tradition we were raised in was very clear, had very clear expectations of our lived experience. My family, everyone knows me today as Rivka, but growing up, it was very clear that my name was Teresa Ann Marie. What do you think my parents were planning to put in front of that? But sister. <laughs> yeah. For others, our ethnic history, you know, the immigration experience of our families is a story that is emphasized or, or celebrated. For some, conforming to a gender identity that somebody else has determined, which, by the way, when we're talking about gender identity, we talk now in terms of the sex assigned at birth because somebody else has determined that based on what they see. They don't necessarily see that somebody is an XXY chromosome or a YYX chromosome. Or a doctor may decide which genitalia looks better because they're not quite clear what it is. The things we impose upon others and that are imposed upon us become part of our identity. We'll do one more. The part of my identity that provides me the most privilege is the most privilege. Sure. What, what the part of my identity that provides me with the most privilege in my life is So yes, for, for some of us, our white privilege cannot be ignored any longer, can it? I'm trying to see, because there's heads. OK, yes, class. We, we live in a society in which the class that we are raised in is held in tension with the class many people find themselves in today. You know, young people who are having to have three and four roommates until their 40s because they can't afford to live the standard that they grew up in. The thousands that are homeless and yet holding down a job, but they can't afford a place to live. There's things here that we see and things that we don't see about someone else's lived experience. Come on back to your seats. I'm okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Right. Right. So, the reason I have folks do this, in, with my seminary students, the way I've explained it to them, and reality is as true as for, for any of us who believe in a spiritual life, is that we can't fully be present to the suffering of another until we recognize all the pieces that come into making up who we are as an individual. For myself, I am a bi woman with disabilities who is married to a trans man and mother of a non-binary young adult who grew up working class Catholic and married into a privileged Jewish family. All these different pieces go into making up who I am, and then some. And that's true for each and every one of us. But as we talked about on Thursday, we make certain assumptions about people, and we say the wrong thing. And when we're called on our errors, you know, oh, I didn't mean anything by it, is often what we'll hear from folks. And those add up to being microaggressions. They add up to the ways that we separate one another from a sense of belonging. You know, we were talking in the service earlier about the difference between fitting in and belonging. Can we possibly belong if we're expected to fit into somebody else's idea of who we are? And so that's the conversation today. Spirit doesn't happen just with us standing up here yapping at you. It also happens in what crystallizes in our conversation. And so I want to invite a conversation. It's one we started in the, in the other room, but for those of you who, aren't, who weren't in there with us, how do we create that sense of welcome where we see the divine spirit in one another and create belonging instead of having an expectation that somebody fits in with how we want to see them and how we want to be in relationship with them. What is the difference between fitting in and belonging? Any thoughts? Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah, if, if we think that we have to meet someone else's expectations, are we really getting to be ourselves? No. What's another element of fitting in versus belonging? Have you ever experienced it? Think back to clicks in high school or that first job trying to figure out the culture. Yes. Right. There's something wrong with you. Um it's it's on you, it's not on the group. Exactly, exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that uh, just, I was just thinking in my work community and so forth, I, I do think what does make it difficult is sometimes when people feel entitled, you know, and I know that uh, like with students, sometimes they they form these cliques and keep out people that, you know, should be included. And um, <clears throat> sometimes entitlement has to do with 
the clothes they wear, and uh, sometimes it has to do with you know other things. But I, I do feel like um, letting go of what we think we're entitled to, um, I think, can open more doors too. Thank you. Uh, entering an energy of of humility and compassion. How about when we see somebody who's homeless on the street? What's our reaction? Do we not want to look over there because it's uncomfortable? Yeah. Do we make assumptions about how they got there? And how about the people who are closest to us? Yeah. I walked the whole journey with my husband as he came to the realization that he could no longer live in a body that everyone else saw as female. It was an easy process because we talked about it for years and he would always go, oh, if it was just a different world. I wasn't as prepared when my non-binary child came out to me. I wanted to understand. Yeah, I'd like to say that I was wholly present and supportive and the perfect mom. I'd been doing queer justice for 30 years, and I failed. I failed my kid because the questions that I had were about me. It wasn't that place of humility. It was, so how did you know this? And, and are you just trying this on? Or are you really exploring? You've always liked dresses. What do you mean? You had 20 Barbie dolls. What do you mean? I wasn't that bad, but I was close. My intent in my head to, be under, to understand their journey had the impact of my child feeling rejected by the one person they thought would be really safe to tell. And it took us a while for me to heal that injury for my child. It took letting go of my expectations of who I wanted them to be. It took letting go and grieving, you know, the little girl who I loved having tea parties with and recognizing the self-contained young adult who chose a name that means my light in Hebrew. They chose the name Lior. And they're still my light even though they have chosen who they are, regardless of what society would tell them. Now, that's not to say they don't still receive lots of microaggressions because their body conforms to the gender assigned to them at birth. They get misgendered a lot. And it's maddening for them. And it's heartbreaking for them. And it's especially so when it's people that are supposed to love and protect them. Cousins, grandparents, intimates. Intent versus impact. How we intend is not nearly as important as the impact we have on the person for whom we are not seeing the Holy Spirit within. Today's reading actually hints to another centurion. Today's the, the reading about this centurion that Peter went to his home and was teaching him, and the Holy Spirit descended on them all as a group is an amplification of an earlier relationship with a centurion that Jesus had. You might recall that in Capernaum, 
a centurion came up to Jesus and said, my slave is, is, is sick and dying. Can you please come and heal? You know, can you please heal them? And Jesus said, yes, I will come to your house, which by the way, would have been a forbidden house for, for him to go to because it was a Roman's house. And the soldier says, oh, you, you don't have to come. Just say the word. Acts of faith by two people who were not part of the Jewish culture that, that Jesus was immersed in. One thing that isn't often highlighted about that is that these were others. These were people who were outside of their culture, outside of their religion. And in the case of, of the centurion who was, who was interacting with Jesus, outside of the dominant understanding we have today of, of genders and sexualities, because the, the understanding we can take from a centurion worrying about a slave boy is that this was a partner of his. It was common in Greek and Roman society that regardless of what we understand about gender and orientation today, a slave boy was a sexual companion for an adult man. So this was somebody who was completely outside of the frame of reference of everyone in Jesus' world. But he recognized within each of them the Holy Spirit. We don't always see past the, the identities and past the, the questions the Holy Spirit radiating within someone. That Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the breath of life reminds us that we're all in the divine image. Magos Day, or um, as we say in, in Hebrew, B'Tselem Elohim. But Elohim, that name of the divine, is rendered God. It, it's actually a plural. Gods. And it's actually non binary in and of itself because it is the representation of all potentiality within the divine, all genders, all ways of being, all of life. And so when we say that we are made in the image of the divine, we're saying we are made as complex and beautiful kaleidoscopes of being with multiple identities that sometimes light brings to this part to the fore floor and, and then another part is brought to the fore. We are a mixture of divine light. And each and every one of us has the opportunity to see, to hear, to witness with humility and compassion, the expressions that flow through a slave boy, through a person who knows themselves to be a different gender than they were born being represented by, who knows themselves to be from a culture that is rich and strong and proud in and of itself, that might not conform to the white supremacist organiza organization of our culture that we live within. We are all B'Tselem Elohim. We are all invited, as in the psalm, to love our neighbor as ourself, to welcome the neighbor. when we can do that, when we can step out of the stories we make about who somebody is, is based on their race or who somebody is based on their orientation and learn from them what it means to be them as opposed to having our suggested ideas, our intent and our assumptions being the guide, listening to them 
at what life is. What are the pieces that make them up? What do they hold sacred in that experience? And what do we use as a microaggression because we're buying into ideas of, of what we think they are and who we think they are and what our understanding as misguided as it might be informs us. We're to love our neighbor, love each other as I have loved you. To do that, we have to see each other in all of our beauty. May it be so. So we have a reading from Psalm 98 uh, that comes from a volume called Psalms in a Translation for Praying by Zalman M. Shakhtar Shalomi. Musicians sing to Yah a brand new song. They have revealed the miraculous order, their kindness as well as their sacred power. They have given us to know how they help us, how they revealed their justice for all to see, how they were ever caring and steadfast to us. To the farthest reaches, it was shown how they rescue the people of Israel. Salute, Yah, with all other earthlings. Come to ecstasy, jubilate, a chorus of celebration. Bands of musicians, tune up your harps for Yah and your lyres, brass, shofars, in fanfare before the sovereign Yah. Roar waves of the sea. Wherever there is life, celebrate. Rivers, offer your ovation. Mountains, sing in chorus. Yah is about to come and rule the earth. Then justice will be the way of life, and nations will be in peace. The body is what? From the first breath we take. It knows when we're hungry, it knows when we're tired, it knows when to wait. It knows how to love, it knows how to trust, it knows how to fear and how to respond, it knows how to bond. With that first voice we hear, the body is wild. There's so much that it knows. The way that it changes, the way that it ages, the way that it grows. It knows when it's hurt. It knows when to laugh. It knows when to cry. Go fast or go slow. Hold on or let go. When to say goodbye. It can swing with ease on a flying trapeze. Play a Mozart concerto without seeing the keys. It can speak any language and sing any song. As our feet find the beat, we start dancing along. The body is wild. 
there's not much it can't do. From scaling the mountains to swimming the oceans to tying your shoes. Every beat of our home, every breath that we breathe, every blink of an eye, never had to be taught. They don't take a thought. We don't even have to try. It remembers each moment and stores it away. All the pain and the pleasure kept somewhere to stay. Every voice that we hear, every face that we see makes me part of you and makes you part of me. The body is one. All the things it can read. It knows when you're lonely. It knows what you need. It knows what you need. It knows how to touch. It senses the truth, it senses a lie. It knows how to feel, it knows how to heal, and it knows how to die. Holy Spirit, you who have given us wisdom through these bodies as we come together in a kaleidoscope of being. Holy Spirit, who has chosen these bodies, circumcised and not Christian and Jewish, Muslim and Hindu, all of our bodies are your gift. We thank you, source of life, who is known by many names and no name, for reminding us that that still small voice is an embodied experience in coming together, hand to hand. We are your B'Tselem Elohim. We are the divine image through the eyes of each one of us, sharing this life together. May you remind us that we are beautiful in your sight. We ask this in all that is holy. Amen, be amen, may it be so. Oh, go in beauty, peace be with you, till we meet in our hearts in the light. Oh, go in beauty, peace be with you. Till we meet in our hearts in the light. 
Just a reminder, if anyone wants to hear a board update, Diane Suffrage will be over here in the fireside area. If you'd like an update on what's happening with the church board, she'll be over there for the next 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 